That's incredible. That's the best we've seen yet. Fourth and fifth graders at Clearview Charter School in Chula Vista, California, work over a two-way interactive video connection with scientists at a local university. Together, they study insects under an electron microscope. OK, introduce yourself, girls. Get in closer, Tammy. This project provides a hands-on understanding of insects far beyond what is possible with traditional classroom resources. Today, students in Jim Dykeman's class collect more insects to examine under the electron microscope. With this insect project that we're doing, somebody could just tell us the parts of an insect, but we go in depth to see closer and learn by ourselves instead of somebody else telling us. Oh! This project that we've been working on with insects is really an effort to teach students what is the life of a scientist really about? What is the scientific process as well? And that's what we're attempting to do. We're studying right now the mouth parts, mostly, and see if the, if the difference of what they eat in their mouth parts. It's a cool bird, like a, um, a beetle. It eats like um, stuff that it has to crunch, so the mouth part is it's like a little cruncher, goes like this. Its mandibles are different than ours. They're on the side of the mouth from here, and they chew this way, not this way. They chew like this, not like this. Like we have schools because we hope that someday when children have left schools that they will still be able to use what it is that they've learned. And there is now a massive amount of evidence from all realms of science that unless individuals take a very active role in what it is that they're studying, unless they learn to ask questions, to do things hands-on, to essentially recreate things in their own mind and then transform them as is needed, the, the, the ideas just disappear. Charles and Albert collected several specimens, but the wasp they want so much still eludes them. And the class has only two days before a scheduled online link-up with the electron microscope. They're doing the collection, they're doing the preparation, they're doing research in order to try to find out what they can about this insect, and then trying to pose some kinds of questions that could be answered through direct observation with this powerful tool that we have, that's the electron microscope itself. If you look at them um, just with the little magnifier, you can only see them about 15 um, max. But with the electron microscope, you, you can go as high as 700 and something to, to see them. And it's kind of interesting that you can see all the hairs on them, and you never thought he had, like, little hairs. So in one sense, you're essentially asking the student to be a researcher, uh, whereas before you might have thought the faculty is doing research, the students are learning. Now, in effect, you're saying to the student, go out and do the research, which is not bounded, which is really limitless, and keep generating the questions because as you find more and more information out there, you'll find that it doesn't necessarily coincide with your first idea. You'll have to change your idea, then you'll have to look for more information to get that into some kind of sync with what you've been thinking. Second of all, it becomes very collaborative. And that can be not just among students, it can be between you and your teacher, or it can be with people in the outside world. So once again, you're functioning almost the way a faculty member or an adult in any field functions as a researcher. All right, I can see most people are just continuing on there. That's good, jumping around sometimes a little bit. You see the students working around. They're pretty much self-motivated and self-directed so that it's not all teacher supervised, teacher directed, they take the responsibility. And I think that's really what becomes a real value of this particular kind of learning. It isn't enough to just wait for it to trickle down through scholars that use here and write textbooks. It's important to get these resources directly in the hands of young learners who wouldn't be able to use the reading rooms of the Library of Congress, but can use this material if we make it more accessible and user-friendly, as we're trying to do all the time. To share their research, Albert and Charles prepare a multimedia report. Lost by Albert and Charles. To the next, to the next page. These interactive multimedia technologies give students a new way to express their ideas and demonstrate what they've learned. We have to make a text box for this one. Using multimedia is just 
uh, a tremendous amount of decision making that has to be done by the students. When they just simply look at the, the, the quantity of resources that are available for them to make this particular report, then they have to become very discriminating as to what pieces they need in order to impart their particular message. Content is extremely important to me, and that's the area where I push on. That's what I do as a teacher, to push the students into finding more information, to synthesizing that information, to putting it in a presentable form that's, that's understandable to them and to the ultimate user. And the components uh, include looking at the insects themselves in the traditional ways that we might through text and pictures, as well as other images of the insects that they might find on CDs or find via the internet and download that way. I'd try AltaVista, that would be my suggestion too. Okay. Okay. 4,000. Okay, you got 4,000. Oh, what's this? That's well, it. it's how to get rid of What's that? What to do with them. It might be useful for you to just save that piece to read offline, okay? Because there's awful lot there. Then you can just take it off and, and read it later on. Maybe there's one or two important points there about controlling wasps that would be important to you. Okay? To <laughs> how to catch one, that might be it. If so, we were back you know in the 1500s, 1600s, and we were Gutenberg inventing this printing press, we'd be so delighted that we'd be able to take knowledge and distribute it and also preserve it for different generations. Imagine, though, we're standing at that same point now where we're not limited to just type on a page. We can preserve ideas, we can represent ideas in a full, uh, um, component of ways. We have images available, we have sound available, we have two-way communication available. And that's where we're standing right now in terms of the capabilities. How we're going to use those is the challenge at the moment. All right. Between now and recess, we have very important Many educators are seeking better ways to evaluate student achievement so that the assessment furthers the learning process. Construct a rubric for the Jim Dykeman helps the students create their own standards or rubrics for assessing the quality of their projects. A good multimedia project. What would be the best multimedia presentation on insects? What would it contain? Thinking about content and also thinking about technique, the way in which it's put together. You need to take one person who's going to record the information. It is more difficult to assess the learning that occurs through this kind of project-based uh, experience, that it is not going to be uh, ex uh, accessible through fill-in-the-bubble kinds of tests, that there are going to have to be much richer forms of assessment that can really capture how much more the students actually know. You can make buttons that can jump to other pages, yeah, links. About how many? In the multimedia project, after the students have actually done a little work with it and done some of their research and started to actually construct the project itself, then we sit down and we discuss what is it that would make the best multimedia presentation. That then is placed in the students' hands so they know what they're working towards. It's not like the teacher's going to give me an A, B, or C, but I don't know what I have to do to get an A, B, or C. So they have all of that up front. And I like to have the students help me develop those particular rubrics because they're the ones that are doing the work. How about some of the other tables sharing some information? It has to be in own word in your own words. Ah, text in own words. Desiree? Good punctuation. With rubrics that have been developed by the students, they're able to look at what they have done, self-evaluate that, get peer feedback and teacher feedback. And what I find is that then they're internalizing the, their desire to improve their work. Do we require for a four that a person have a self-drawn picture or animation? That's the question. When expectations are clear to both students and teachers, students develop the ability to assess their own progress, a skill essential for lifelong learning. Okay, I think we've just left out one important part of multimedia. When we think of multimedia, we think of text, graphics, and Amanda's got it behind you maybe there. Sounds. Ah! 
Yes, sound, guys, sound. One last time. Graphics, sounds. We should assess to say, all right, here, here's what you can do, here's what you haven't done. How can we help you improve? How does this information, how does this feedback help you know and help us know what you might do to be better? It is not the skill level that changes. Everybody comes out with the same skill level. It's the time it takes that changes. And some people take two and a half times uh, as long to learn as other people. That's, that's the way people are. That's the way we are in, in certain areas. So when a school finally figures out that, that the, the, um, each student must learn each step before they go to the next, uh, and everybody will be competent in each step, and everybody will make an A, then we'll change our view of, of tests. Wait a minute. Daniel, you're not answering my question. You're just jamming for somewhere. Okay, I don't see the paper in your hand. I don't see it checked off. I haven't seen the discussion that you've had with your partners. Okay, we don't just go and get going without some planning. Thank you. Did one just keep it like this, or this just keep it like um, that? And you want to change the colors in the inside? And we do these projects in the multimedia usually with at least groups of two, sometimes three. So in those groups, there's a great deal of uh, cooperation as to what are we going to include, a great deal of discussion. And that's learning in itself. Cooperative learning is a natural living laboratory that gives children the chance to master and practice a set of essential skills for life. They're skills you could call emotional intelligence. They're how you handle your own emotions and work things out with people, how you deal with other, other kids, other people in your life. Things like uh, managing your temper. Uh, you're not going to be able to blow up and work with a group that exerts pressure on you to, to learn how to do that. Cooperative learning, project-based learning, and alternatives to grades to assess what's been learned? This doesn't sound like the schools most of us went to. As these innovations are introduced, schools must keep parents better informed and encourage greater involvement in their children's education. When children see their parents and teachers working together, it sends a clear and consistent message about the value of learning. At Clearview Charter, parents meet regularly with teachers and staff to discuss the school program in an open forum. It's an opportunity for teachers to explain their approaches to learning to both parents and students. You might be asking yourself the question, why, how do we go about figuring out, trying to assess whether or not students are doing any real learning while they're going through this process of reading? Education of our parents is as important as the education of our children. We're out here trying to let parents know what we're doing and why we're doing it. That we're, we're not giving up on multiplication and addition and spelling. We're doing all those things, but we're just doing it in the context of using technology to improve those particular skills. How is it different than learning without multimedia and without computer? What I have seen in students in the last couple of years who have now had the exposure to technology, and not only in computer but videotape technology, uh, laser disc technology, they have a, a very high comfort level with that technology. But it also provides them a feeling of accomplishment that I have not seen in, say, traditional forms of education. I mean, I've seen such improvement in Albert's academic work, reading comprehension, computers, the technology of computers has really opened up a lot for Albert. And I see him wanting to come to school uh, right early and leave late, you know, always calling me, can I stay a little later? And I need to finish up a project or, you know, and that's, I'm like, wow, yeah, sure. The involvement in the, of the parents and the learning of the child makes a big difference. It is the interaction between the child uh, and the parent that makes the learning meaningful. Uh, children are almost programmed to please adults, and their first appreciation of themselves comes from uh, the feedback from the important people around them and the most important people are the parents. Well, it's to help you tomorrow. It's to help you tomorrow when you're actually directing 
Steve on the microscope. Let's take a look. It's the day before Jim Dykeman's class goes online with the scientists using the electron microscope. But after numerous efforts, Albert and Charles still have not caught a wasp. We don't know what kind of bug it is. We don't know where it was. I just found it on a leaf. I don't know if it has two. Even with cutting edge technology, learning still has setbacks and frustrations. Now, you did not collect a wasp. Yep. Did you? But he found one. Okay. Where is that? It's in my garage. Still in your garage flying around, right? Okay. It's not going to do us that much good. But, yeah, but we know where he found it. Right. But what you want from the microscope, you want something that looks like a wasp. Okay? So you didn't collect a beetle, really doesn't look like a wasp, but some of the other things we have, we have uh, a bee, okay? Yeah, but that's not our... I know, I know. Well, it I has know. to be a representative. Right, that's exactly, now you got the picture, okay? So the representative insect collected would be a bee. Understand? That way you get a chance to see what the mouth parts look like on an animal, an insect, that looks similar to the one that you had for your project. So do you think this will give us additional information or not? Probably so. Albert, could you get up here? Okay, you're kind of hiding down there. What? It's not a wasp. We need a wasp. Well, you had the opportunity. I still got it. I can't get it. Well, it's a little late. If we're going on, so if we're going online tomorrow, and it's still flying his flying around in his garage. Okay, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna try to force you to do anything here, Albert. But I think if you'll sit down and think about it, you'll probably come up with some kind of a conclusion about what's going to be best here. Teachers need to be able to elicit students' thinking. They also need to be able to interpret what they hear students saying in terms of their learning. What does it mean about students' progress uh, when they portray a problem in a certain way or get stuck on a particular concept? And finally, they need to be able to continually um, elicit understandings about how kids are thinking about their work. Uh, not just whether they have the right answer. Uh, so this requires a lot of new tools for teachers. And probably an assassin bug or... In the San Diego State University that, laboratory, entomologist now, Dr. Kathy Williams there. and Dr. Steve Barlow prepare for a live fiber optic link into Jim Dykeman's classroom miles away. After them is E8. E8. Was that you, Rodrigo? Amanda G, Desiree, and Emily. With an electron microscope, they'll examine and discuss the insect specimens gathered and prepared by Albert, Charles, and their classmates. All right, Steve, I think we're ready to go. Introduce yourselves, boys. Hi, I'm Charles. Hi, I'm Albert. And my name is Patrick. Okay, so we'll start with your first sample now? Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is the head of it. Now we wanted, last week we were talking about looking at uh, mouth parts, correct? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay, so here you can see the two eyes, and in the center is just kind of this long, looks like a nose. <laughs> and then down at the very end of the nose, if we increase the magnification here. What is that? What does it look like? Mouse. Teeth? teeth? Looks a lot like teeth. What do you think they use it for? Probably to kept, catch food. Well, that's a good start. That's a good idea. It's really tiny, though, if you think about it. So what kind of food would they get with that, with little tiny teeth like that? Gnats. OK, gnats. Tiny flies. OK, maybe tiny flies. Um, do you know um, of the sandy, does it do the uh, mouth parts? Um, look, look like a bee or a wasp. Well, what do you think? Do you have any ideas about that? I think they are because um, they're related. That's right. The bees and the wasps have a lot of similarities in their mouth parts. You're getting to be good entomologists there. 
Because um, me and Charles are doing a project on wasps. Uh huh. But we haven't found the wasp, so we just did the sand bee and we looked at the contribution of Dr. Williams. It was incredible because she was giving information, she was engaging the students in conversation, she was asking the students questions, thereby they had to formulate their thinking to respond. And that is what's important because we can look at things all day, but if we don't formulate some kind of response to what we see, we're just taking in information, we're not synthesizing it in any way. So that's what I feel the, the value of the experts and the interaction is what gives the students the impetus to internalize some of the learning. I think that the changes we see happening today in these technology enriched environments are very important for two reasons. I mean, first of all, um, what you find is that these environments are encouraging kids to engage constantly in active search and then taking what they're finding combining it with what other kids have found and working kind of collaboratively on constructing something with what they find. So they're learning how to search, how to challenge what they find, and then how to combine what they find with others. And if there's anything we learn in kind of corporate America today is the absolute importance of teamwork. It's so ironic to me that in the schools we focus almost exclusively in the past on the performance of the individual, often at the cost of other individuals. Whereas when you get into the workplace, it's really the ability to productively work with others that really matters.